Welcome to our monthly nonfiction book discussion group. I'm like, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed because we used to have a sort of intimate little group of 10 or 15. And today we've got um, over 40 people, maybe 50 people. So we're just going to try this and, and hopefully um, keep our fingers crossed. If you would, because we really do want to have a discussion, you know, and it takes um, it takes away from the discussion to um, have to call on people or, you know, raise your hand and get called on. The discussion just kind of slows down. So I would invite you if you have a comment or a question or would like to respond to one of Tom's um, excellent questions as part of his study guide, please just speak up, please, please. And if two people start talking at once, we'll just, we'll wait and we'll take turns. And then there is of course the chat option also. So this is our monthly um, nonfiction book discussion where uh, those of us who um, come to nonfiction books take turns and Bless his heart, Tom Ehrenshorst volunteered to lead the discussion of this book that's been on the bestseller list forever and is talked about lots of places that you go. And I think that we will have uh, an excellent, excellent day. And I'd like to turn it over right now to Tom Ehrenhorst and thank him profusely for um, leading our discussion today, Tom. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, I, I would add one thing to the to the uh, uh, to the notes about our discussion. Those those of us who like I uh, as I uh, uh, tend to be eager to talk. Re remember to try to leave some air time for people who are a little bit less forward and jumping in, so that uh, so that we get a lot of spread of uh, of sharing of ideas here and sharing of thoughts. Um, I'd like to begin just with a, a couple of, uh, just a little bit about Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson was born uh, in Washington, D.C. in 1961 uh, to parents who left Virginia during the Great Migration, about which she wrote in her, in her earlier uh, great book. Her father was one of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. Wilkerson studied journalism at Howard University, becoming editor-in-chief of the college newspaper, The Hilltop. During college, she interned at publications, including the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. So clearly she was a journalist, uh, journalist rocket. Uh, in 1994, while the Chicago, Bu Chicago Bureau Chief of the New York Times, while she was the Chicago Bureau Chief, she became the first woman of African-American heritage to win the Pulitzer Prize in journalism, winning the feature writing award for her coverage of the 1993 Midwestern floods and her profile of a 10-year-old boy who was responsible for four siblings. Wilkerson has been the James Cox Professor of Journalism at Emory University, Ferris Professor of Journalism at Princeton University, the Krieger Wolf Endowed Lecturer at Northwestern University, and Professor of Journalism and Director of Narrative Nonfiction at Boston University's College of Communication. After 15 years of research and writing, she published The Warmth of Other Sons, this epic story or the epic story of America's great migration uh, and she published this in 2010. Wilkerson interviewed over a thousand people for the warmth of other sons which documents the stories of African Americans who migrated to northern and western cities during the 20th century. The warmth of other sons was a bestseller and winner of numerous awards including the National Book Critics Circle Award. Wilkerson's book Cast, our subject for today, uh, cast the origins of our discontents, argues that racial stratification in the United States is best understood as a caste system akin to those in India and Nazi Germany. A 2020 review in the New York Times described it as an instant American classic and almost certainly the keynote nonfiction book of the American century thus far. The book peaked at number one in the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. On October 14, 2020, Netflix announced Ava DuVernay will write, direct, and produce a feature film adaptation of Cast. Mrs. Wilkerson 
uh, Ms. Wilkerson is now 60 years old. Um, moving ahead, just uh, we can begin our discussion. I, um, I wanted to toss out the, the an initial question. What about this book uh, surprised you? Sue? I, th I think that, you know, I really hadn't thought of the caste system be being in the United States and thinking about India and South Africa. But after reading it, um, it really does fit. And I was thinking about the hillbilly elegy and how people in uh, Appalachia were resistant to taking any support from the government in terms of, of healthcare and other things. And um, because they didn't want to put themselves in the same level as, as uh, people less than them. And that sort of kind of made this uh, theory stick with me. I could see where she was coming from. Um, so anyway, it's, it's hard to think of. My, uh, my partner was looking at this book and he said, I just don't believe it, it's, it's impossible. And, and I think if I could convince her to read the book, he might have a different attitude. But anyway, it's interesting. I, I think that uh, she does have a premise and I can see lots of ways that it works. And um, it, I think in just ordinary thinking, it's hard to, hard to think that we have a caste system here, but uh, I do think that it's, there is certainly something in place that uh, it's very hard to get out of one layer that you need to get to another one. I found I, what surprised me is how hard it was to read. I mean, it was wonderfully written, but just the gut wrenchingness of it. Kind of like hammer blows one after another. Yeah, I found it pretty alarming too. But the, the thing that surprised me, and I don't want to steal the first line of your notes, but I was surprised she started talking about global warming and methane in the Arctic. And I was like, wait a minute. Okay, is this an environmental book? But uh, she tied it up. And uh, I, sorry, I'm jumping the agenda. <laughs> well, yeah, but, go, but go ahead. How, how did the yeah. uh, how did her how did her her little story about the uh, permafrost in uh, in the in in Russia or in there in, in uh, Siberia? How did that connect? Well, I mean, the, the idea is here's a th something we've been ignoring for years that's going to come and haunt us for years, and it's the same thing with race. We've ignored it for years. It slowly bubbled up like you know, lakes melting in the Arctic, and now we've got a big problem to deal with. Yeah, I think she, I think she's a storyteller and her just amazing use of metaphors to make her point in telling the story. So it fit in so well, you're right. Didn't think we were going into global warming, but once you read it, it was about what's right under the surface. And, you know, Tom, getting back to the original question of what surprised me, I think what surprised me is how I continue to be surprised. Uh, you feel like you know basically what the issues are and as an educated person, you like to think of yourself as an educated person, uh, that to go into this book thinking you really know the story, but the way she connects the dots in such a way that it's right there in plain sight, but we don't necessarily, you know, connect the dots. And that's what a great author can do for each and all of us. I especially like the uh, fact that she used a lot of examples from her own life, because obviously here's, like you said, Tom, somebody who has stellar credentials and still by the way she looked, she was treated as somebody who was less than. And uh, that just made it all the more real. Her storytelling uh, enabled, or at least helped me to uh, to understand, and, and other books have done this too, but uh, to understand the nature of the problems we're talking about, even though I'm so privileged uh, by this by these systems that it's much more comfortable, uh, and uh, in fact, it's difficult to you know to think of of the problems that affect other people. It, 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 uh, this book helped stretch me uh, in those directions. Any other surprises? Having um, having been in the last in recent years really exposed to uh, the issue of slavery, from uh, from twelve years a slave to uh, all of Dr. Johnson's uh, his Civil War reconstruction and now his Black Church uh, seminars where he very bluntly and of course the movie and going even back to Roots 
the um, the violence, the the violence that was there in in um, slavery, but it just with the book felt one anecdote after another, just kind of being hit on the head that um, it needed to be kind of drilled into it us. It needed to shock us over and over, which is what she did. Yeah, I, I found this book uh, very difficult to read at some points and it was just incredible to read about Nazi Germany taking a lesson from the US. Like how did they do that and still, you know, come out looking like they were okay to the world? What was stunning is that they actually looked at us and said, well, we're not gonna go that far. I mean, that, <laughs> that was the amazing part of it. I mean, the Nazis even thought we were out of control. It's that's a real eye opener to me. Painful. Yeah, I, I I don't imagine a lot of the book was a surprise to someone who's not white. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, mean, I uh, the surprise. I would be interested in in uh, in hearing whether uh, people who are not white uh, are surprised by the characterization of our of our systemic injustices as caste. Uh, you know, that, that that's kind of, that's, of course, part of the revelation here in the book. Yeah, I hadn't thought of uh, the U.S. as having a caste system because it is so race-based. It's hard to make that distinction. But when you think about other groups who were looked down upon initially, but then were able to move into, quote, white society, which Black people could never do. I was uh, very taken by her picking up the uh, Indian Hindu caste system, which, you know, we all look to Hinduism as being more elite almost. And yet there has the caste system in India, which still remains. I wonder if any of you remember her speaking in Holland. Uh, a number of years ago, she was at the Herrick Library and a wonderful speaker. That would be a treat. Yeah, I don't remember. And it was interesting to me that the, the, Dal the whatever, the, were they Dalits or Dalits? The Untouchables are a, another group, another tribe who are darker. Uh, and that I didn't realize that they were actually darker. So they have their own blacks in India in, the, in a way because these people are from a different tribe that has darker skin. Just to give you an example of the uh, uh, kind of our ignorance of a caste system. Years ago, I worked <clears throat> uh, at the in the library system at Notre Dame, and I became friendly with this one student who was from India, and he had come and he was given a, a, an advisor, and this college just said, well. They're both Indians. It'll be just, you know, he'll be a mentor to him. And, and the poor fellow was going, you know, they couldn't have done anything worse because he's a Brahmin and I forget what caste uh, Rao was, but um, he said, he says, I'll never be able to get a job. He won't, he doesn't even think I should be here. Wow. I thought it was interesting how um, she talked about how <clears throat> Um, America is divided by race rather than um, heritage, like you're not European, you're white, or you're not uh, Kenyan, you're black. And I had never thought about it that way, but I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, and we're not, we're not divided by aristocracy or, you know, those kind of economic historic divisions, you're right is not so much. One of the things that uh, really struck me as I read this book uh, was the uh, section on the eight pillars of caste. Um, so I thought I grew up in a reasonably uh, progressive environment, uh, but as I was reading these, they were like hammer blows. It was uh, uh, obvious to me that all of these were, uh, uh, beliefs that were held by the uh, world around me as I was growing up. Uh, even though I'm not sure anybody 
said them as as uh, you know as as clearly or as blatantly as uh, Isabel Wilkinson outlines them, uh, but somehow I got that message uh, that, that that they were all there, mm -hmm. uh, and it was just like I, you know, some of these I read I, you know, I I, I felt like I was. Uh, a uh, little kid back in the 50s trying to make sense out of the world uh, with these things. Uh, it was just, there's so much of a part of our culture that we, we don't even realize they're there. Yeah, Wilkerson's really developed layers of, uh, of uh, analysis uh, in, into, her, in, into her book here. It's really fascinating or fascinatingly organized and thought out uh, in many ways. Um, uh, the uh, I, I, had a, I had a thought about the uh, about the permafrost image uh, at the beginning of the book. Is it, is it in that that allowed her to introduce the the word and then kind of and, and kind of uh, insert the concept of pathogens uh, of, of these of these pathogens of the past, uh, which you know, kind of uh, puts a different kind of spin on, on on things. Any other thoughts about that about the, the permafrost beginning beginning and how that led into her thesis? It was startling in some ways because at least that was um, a particular piece of science information that I had not heard about. And I think um, because it was a little bit startling, she really um, grabs our attention doing it. And it was toxic. Um, and that certainly fits with her um, um, story throughout the book that racism is toxic to our society. Wayno, did you have your hand up too? Did, did you have something to say, Wayno? No, maybe not. Wayno, check your, please, Wayno, please check your, uh, you're on mute. So please, if you'd like to say something, unmute yourself. I think the other way to look at the permafrost is that if an opening occurs, it's hard to, to uh, hold back the escape of those gases. And uh, we should always be alert for openings where they may occur. Uh, and once they escape, I guess you use another metaphor, how hard does it get the genie back in the bottle? Am I, am I able to be heard now? Yep, you figured it out. Uh, I would like to comment as a surprise being a uh, first generation uh, of a Finnish immigrant family, that the Nordics were listed as a caste, the Norwegian, Swedish, and Finnish is probably the biggest surprise of the book in my uh, history of uh, being a Nordic Finn, so to speak, uh, still speak the language. But I was surprised that that was included in the, the ranking of a caste. Well, you fixed that problem because Donald Trump only wanted Nordic people coming to America. So you're finally, you finally <clears throat> recovered that. Uh... Well, and I grew up in Wisconsin and, and there was really kind of a, uh, a lot of people were Scandinavian, but there was a lot of distinction whether you were a Swede or you were um, from Norway or you're from Denmark. And I think where I grew up it was mostly um, German and Swedes and Norwegians, but um, there was a little bit of conflict there and, and layering about which who was on top in terms of um, society. So it was kind of interesting, even even whether you were white or not, there was a, a little bit of layering of uh, ethnicity. In my small town of Ironwood, uh, blacks were not allowed to stay at overnight in the facilities, the, the man on the train from uh, Chicago had to stay on the train because he was black. I think, was Michigan one of the sunset towns where a black could visit but never sleep? I know Oregon was back in the there, territory. There were plenty of them in Michigan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the KKK was also strong in Ironwood in the Upper Peninsula, uh, because one of the members of the school board there was a officer in the KKK. I remember. Oh gosh, 
all yeah. the way to the UP. Yeah, I think that's yes. true. Yeah, I worked at a restaurant in Manistique when I was in, in uh, high school and college, and it was owned by a Greek family. And a pipeline was coming through with workers from Louisiana. And the mother, this Greek mother said, you can't serve those black people who come here. And I, they were an immigrant family and were making distinctions about who could be in their restaurant. In my grandfather's memoirs about growing up in Wisconsin, in Cedar Grove, Wisconsin, from about the 1880s, he reflects that it was a caste system between which province of the Netherlands you came from. There were better and worse you know, categories to be in according to province. But maybe that's not caste, that's a regional thing. Although, you know, region plays into this as well. Yeah, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question, is that at what level of, uh, of prevailing social and political discrimination uh, and bias, at what level do you, do you call it caste and not? And, and, I, and I think Wilkerson's got some things to say about that. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, uh, the, in chapter two, uh, Wilkerson starts off telling about a house inspector shining an infrared light on the underpinnings uh, of an inherited old house. Uh, you know, how does she connect that scene to our civic responsibilities in 2021? She certainly makes the point about an old house always needing attention and needing repairs. And it certainly seems to be, she made the point about um, our society being like that and needing repairs. So very early, she she slips in the the notion into into her uh, into her story and into her thesis that there are things that that the readers are going to be responsible for. Maybe. Yep. And, yeah, I think there's also the concept that you can't always see uh, in an old house. It may look okay on the outside and even on the inside until things start to happen. And it's been interesting to see how hard it has been to, for the uh, issues of African-Americans to come to the general white attention. I mean, I remember the Rodney King beating and just being horrified, but that was really one of the first things that was recorded because we didn't necessarily see these things or experience them. Mm -hmm. Her comments on that uh, grounding of the house and that reflect back to our government. Definitely. We have to keep a watch on it and keep it updated and in good shape. It's not enough to just to want it to be the way it was. But yeah. it's going to take some work. Yeah, you. A lot of times you hear people say, well, you know, I didn't own slaves and I didn't do this and I don't care now because that was so long ago. But the analogy of the house, we're all living in this house. Um, and what happens to the house over, year, over time um, does affect everybody, whether they realize it or not. And, and if we all live in this house, don't we all have some responsibility for it? I really liked, um... There's a quote I wrote down that she made towards the end of the book. It kind of relates to this. Uh, we, we, are not, um, we are not personally responsible for what people who look, what people look like. Oh, sorry. I got a, I was really tired when I was writing this down. So <laughs> I might have to look back at the, Page number a second. It's okay. Take your time. And I'll get back to you because I I wrote down. I wrote it down and then uh, here we are. I'm on a device and not on 
pages, so it's a bit harder to get to it. While you're looking at it, it's why it, it uh, this this image of the house, as you as you said, Ben, uh, highlights how uh, how masterfully uh, Wilkerson uses uh, metaphors and images to uh, you know to make real and to make memorable the point she's making. She's she's a, her storytelling ability comes through over and over. Oh gosh, come on. Tom, do you want to share some of those metaphors that you pointed out while Mary's looking up, Mary Randall's looking up her quote? Well, and, and yeah, and if, and if, if please, uh, if, if we're thinking about meta metaphors, uh, if there are favorites uh, or things that stick in your mind, please uh, pop forward with them. I just wrote down some uh, likening the caste system to an unseen skeleton uh, or, or to a wordless usher in a darkened theater. You know, some of these kind of things. Uh, um, the human pyramid encrypted into us all. And I found it. Anyway, I've got it. Um, we are not personally responsible for what people who look like us did centuries ago, but we are responsible for what good or ill we do to people alive with us today. I really liked that quote of hers. Yeah. I remember so very vividly when this all um, came to my to my un better understanding. I um, grew up, uh, I actually went to, uh, I was bused to an inner city um, junior high school where I was, a min the whites were a small minority. And maybe I didn't think about race the way I should have until one day in 1968, I was uh, working at the library at uh, the University of Michigan and a, a black, um, young black woman came up to me screaming and waving her hands came right in my face and said, you killed him, you killed him. And it was when Martin Luther oh. King was killed. And I felt, I, I felt, horrified and to this day I still it's very vivid in my memory of uh, that that I would I it was as if I had personally um, pulled the trigger and and it, it had a huge impact on me. Another metaphor the, the long-running play mm -hmm. and how we all play roles in that play and in some ways how we are typecast if we could use that phrase, in terms of playing a particular role, that we really don't have any, any choice in our parts. They're kind of given to us and expected of us, and we're born into those parts and die in those same parts. Yeah, I think that, that's a really powerful ending. How, how does Wilkerson differentiate the concept of caste from that of racism? This is really a, a, you know, kind of a core issue in the book. Well, she is really very explicit about that, Tom. Um, she says that caste is the granting or withholding of respect, status, honor, attention, privileges, resources, benefit of the doubt, and human kindnesses to someone on the basis of their perceived rank or standing in the hierarchy. And then she says, I'm on page 70. She says, what's the difference between racism and casteism? Because they're interwoven in America, it's hard to separate the two. But um, she says, any action or institution that mocks, harms, assumes, or attaches inferiority or stereotype on the basis of the sign construct of race can be considered racism. I personally, I, uh, I find it easier to understand racism and I, I, I 
I personally seem to think of the caste system as that that pervades in India, which is attached to a religious and a, um, in, in their view, God-given uh, hierarchy. But there certainly have been people in this country who think that um, reacting to people on the basis of race is God-given. Just the point I was going to try and say. And there, and there are people in India who, are, who don't accept the caste system's uh, inherent relevance, uh, but, but they're unable to change it. I was struck as I read the book, that the use of the concept of caste versus racism um, might have made it easier to deal with the topic of racism by using a less um, powerful word, a, a word that we wouldn't necessarily immediately be defensive about. I'm wondering if anybody else had that sense, that it was a safer word. Clearly they're different concepts, but I just, maybe I just took it in as a concept of racism that was easier to take in, not using that the word racism. Yeah, I, I actually thought it was a good mirror device. You know, she says there's this word that we associate with a whole other part of the world. And of course, it doesn't apply to us. It's just something India has been doing for many years. And well, wait a minute, we're looking in a mirror. <laughs> That's how I said it. The other thing I think even today, we're seeing somewhat of a caste system or a racist uh, Tom or Jim Crow laws, what's happening with the last election and what's going on in in southern states now trying to limit the vote again. For example, Georgia has passed a law that the, the church, the, the black Sunday. churches that took, took people to church on Sunday, but then took them to vote on the afternoon, put a law that you can't do that anymore. So we see this happening, as she said at the end, she talked about the Voting Rights Act. We see that happening again here. And one of the scary things about it is it's not just in the South that those um, uh, legislatures are making those moves. It's in uh, a number of, of northern states also, in, including Michigan. Sure, even Wisconsin. Right. Definitely including Michigan. Wilkerson makes, makes this, this point that really re repeatedly that where race for a lot of people is, is, an, is an attitudinal thing, caste is this forced uh, and reinforced uh, uh, assignation of value, uh, and uh, it's uh, where it's, uh, it's systemic rather than personal. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of in, a, in its in its footing. I think our 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 political parties have become castes in a sense because they flip flopped to what they are today, which seems to show the more liberal view is more amenable to the acceptance of the black community than the conservative view used to be as reflected with uh, the uh, Abraham Lincoln and so forth. The parties kind of look like they almost flip-flopped. Depending on which party is more eager to appeal to which cast. In what ways, uh, in what ways did, did this book change your own thinking about US racism, uh, social structure and, and, and systemic uh, injustice? In what ways did it, did it you know, was it different from how you thought about things before? I think for me, um... I can really see how much we need to revise our history books and rewrite a lot of things about what has happened in the past. I didn't get the education that told me this. I mean, eh, sprinklings of it, but this is this should be in every 
high school history class, as far as I'm concerned, American history class. Working with children's books, I can underscore that with the realization how whitewashed children's books have been in the past, even though we think that we have a whole generation of children's books beginning in the 60s that were clear about civil rights and that could re reach children with this. I don't think that's nearly as true as we think it is. We don't realize how much blocking an awareness of this still goes on in children's books, perpetuating certain myths that are so popular and sell well, but they are just wrong in terms of everything that Isabel Wilkinson is pointing out, Wilkerson is pointing out. The greatest challenge would be to get someone to, that could get books accepted that would tell what we were learning. Yeah. The thing about myths about Native Americans that, uh, you know, kind of, oh, this wonderful kind of dancing and stuff, and not recognizing how much they were abused and taken away from their property. Following up with what John just said, having taught on Rosebud Indian Reservation part time for 15 years, there's another caste system in South Dakota and out west with the Native American community. Well, and the other thing is that regardless of which um, minority, or in the case of women in general, the majority, um, you will, we will have to do something about the fact that the Texas Board of Education does not um, decide which textbooks are going to be used throughout the United States. Until we get that done, um, everybody is, is fighting this, um, the inaccuracies or the omissions of it, the books available. Right. Mm, it's, it's too, much, is, too much of a big dog rule. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people are aware that that is the case. Um, that Texas dictates what's in textbooks. Uh, but I became aware of it as a library media specialist. Um, one of the first things that it, my first job, I, I walked into the library in the first job, library media specialist job I had and was just shocked at, at the books that were on the shelf because they were they had just pretty much kept anything and everything. And, uh, and the pictures that went along with many of the books were, um, were really appalling and upheld stereotypes. And I, I had a fight with the history teacher because I wanted to get rid of books. And she said, but the information is just fine. Why should we get rid of the book? And I said, because it's promoting stereotypes through the pictures as well as some of the wording. And we, she finally came around after um, some time, but it, it took a while. <laughs> she was not happy with me for quite a while, but that's something that we need to think about as well as what, what's in our books that are on the shelves that our kids have access to. Well, and now it is not just the books, it's making sure that they understand what websites they're using. Yeah. Oh, you know, now I have, just before I retired, I was having discussions with uh, local uh, teachers, not, not librarians so much, but with teachers attempting to they were get they were it was senior high school and the kids were getting close to World War II, and they were looking at Nazi sites and not realizing what they were. Ooh. Right, that that was one of my pet peeves is that most school systems no longer have library media specialists whose job it is to teach how to do research on the internet, and it was one of my biggest frustrations. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things to, to get back to Tom's question of the concept of, of caste um, to me explains somewhat of, we get to it in race, but in caste, 
clearly people want somebody below them. As long as there's someone below them, then I'm okay as long as I got somebody below me. And, and that's, that's more than just racism. And, and, and it, it really is classism or caste. So that system that we live in in the United States isn't talked about much, but it's just one more concrete foundation that has to be dismantled to make progress with race because we need somebody below or I need somebody below me to have value. And uh, that's what struck me in, in the, the caste racism concept that just made the, the idea of dealing with race so much more difficult. So, so the question then becomes, is it somewhat human nature to need somebody below you? And I also think about this in relationship to the environment. If we look at resources, if resources are unequally uh, distributed, then you're going to want people below you. If resources are equally available in some way, or more readily equally available, maybe that characteristic of human beings would be less inclined to come out. This notion of needing somebody below you that, that, that was very helpful to me uh, to, in, in CAST uh, to try to make sense of uh, things that don't that defy sense, like uh, why did poor why did poor whites in the South uh, uh, in the time of the Civil War uh, side so readily with the with the rich landowners who dominated their lives uh, rather rather than be in favor of freeing the, the slaves um, and uh, it also helped me deal with our, our the confusions we have about races about thinking about racism. Uh, where nobody wants to be, nobody wants to acknowledge or, or, or describe himself or herself as a racist, uh, and we have these these kind of difficult to handle concepts of unconscious or subconscious racism, unintended racism, all of which are real. But but then they but to go, to have them in the same basket with overt aggressive hostile racism is confusing. On the other hand, the thinking about it in terms of caste, all of a sudden makes this, if at least for me, helps to make this all kind of fall into order. Uh, and now I can see how, you know, how caste describes my participation in it in a way that, I, that it's frustrating for me to think about racism describing it. Because mm -hmm. I don't, it's an attitudinal thing. Yeah. I was struck by somewhere in the book, and I don't know where this is exactly, Tom. Um, Isabel Wilkerson says that um, the one way to think about race is to see it as racism, is to see it as a continuum, sort of the way we, um, oh, we nowadays talk about um, youngsters who are on the autism spectrum, but racism can be thought of that same way. Uh, I, somewhere in the book, she said that. And that helped me kind of get it in my head. I tied the book um, to a lot of the political chatter last summer about whether or not we are a country with systemic racism. And if you remember during the summer and the racial protests, um, there was a lot of denial in the po political world. Well, our country isn't systemically racist and um, when you read the book and especially the analogy with the house and the foundation of the house and the hidden problems within the house, um, I thought there was a real connection to that conversation from last summer. Yeah. I almost find it easier um, in terms of the idea of caste to look at our immigrant populations from the South because um, I don't know how many of you follow um, Heather Cox Richardson, but a couple of days ago, she gave a wonderful history of our border policy. And years ago, it used to be that we welcomed immigrants coming in, working uh, in various jobs, they earned money, and then they went home. 
um, by closing our borders, we actually created a problem of once people are here, they're afraid to go home because, um, and yet our system depends on this group of people to do what are considered menial jobs and manual labor and things like that. We very much want them to be relegated, relegated to that caste, but not have a formal system of having worker visas and things like that. So it just gives us an avenue of, of uh, you know, prejudice against those folks. And uh, that doesn't need to be that way. Or it could be, we want you to come to our area when it's time to pick the peaches, but then we want you to go back home again and not make our lives complicated by trying to stay all winter. And that kind of thing that would be an attitude that we think is accepting and welcoming, but really it's a sort of caste feeling. I think the caste system even in a, is our pay system in this country because we, we are, have our national minimum wage at $7.25 an hour. No one can live or work on that. And that just puts people into an economic level that they never can escape from. So I think we really have to look at, when I was in Norway, probably almost 20 years ago, and I, we were talking with a waitress about tips. And she said, you know, in Norway, and this was, I think in 2006, I make $20 an hour. I do not rely on tips. Everyone in Norway gets paid a living wage so they can afford an apartment, they can find a medical care, housing, whatever, childcare. And a lot of the things are actually built into their social network. Um, in our country, we don't do that. And, and we have a caste system, even according to education and whatever, because the person that picks up our garbage is just as important as the, another person that does something else. If someone doesn't come and get our garbage every week, we're gonna be in big trouble, but we don't have respect for all work. And I think that's part of our caste system in this country too. And we don't want to acknowledge that person working at uh, uh, McDonald's is working really hard to flip those hamburgers and serve people. And we feel like they deserve little. And I, I really have, I think that's a caste system right here at work in our country that uh, we don't really even acknowledge, but it, it makes very different economic levels and, and standards of living. And this it's really a, hard to get out of it. This is a this is a tricky kind of spot because this is a spot where I think I think Wilkerson would try to draw draw a difference between class and caste, where caste is is so rigid and fixed that it's not possible to escape. That there, and, and that the whole that the society is invested in maintaining these rigid identifications, where where the 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 very real. Uh, economic uh, strictures and uh, and and uh, uh, limitations that you're talking about are somewhat more fluid uh, and uh, can change over time. Uh, so that I I think Wilkerson would not want those that to be called caste, rather rather class or you know it's another systemic injustice. Um, but yes. Um, the what one cast reviewer has criticized Wilkerson uh, for uh, for kind of missing or downplaying the degree to which economic ambitions have underlain the creation and maintenance of the American caste system. Do you think that uh, Wilkerson missed this, or do you think that it's yeah. something that's worth uh, criticizing? I think you made. Can I make a comment here? Yeah. 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 I think you made some good points there. The I have some difficulty with the with the uh, close uh, correlation between uh, uh, the Indian caste system and and whatever system we have here. I've known quite a few Indians in in the scientific lab, scientific world. Uh, most of them were Brahmins, uh, educated in, uh, in in India and then in in the United Kingdom and so on. Uh, but have talked with them about the uh, caste system and. It is, in their mind at least, um, uh, almost intrinsic to the society. It's, it's, it's an accepted uh, system where you're born into a caste and it may limit, it certainly limits one's upward mobility in terms of uh, uh, what we would consider uh, social uh, structure. 
uh, but it gives a certain stability to the to the uh, society, such that uh, those who are in a particular caste are in that caste. They know they're in that caste, and that's their life. They they marry within that caste. They live within that caste. There are many many castes, and and but there is very little what we would call social uh, mobility. Uh, I think that. Um, in spite of all the uh, imperfections that uh, we all recognize in our society, there is a certain level of economic uh, mobility uh, within uh, our society. There are uh, Blacks who uh, are college professors and uh, are educated in, in uh, lots of professions that uh, 100 years ago or 150 years ago were not possible. So I think that the strict, that, that this, this, this uh, rigid, um, uh, uh, correlation between um, the American system and Indian system is uh, is, a, is a weakness in the book. Uh, I, it's been a while since I read the book, but uh, in reflecting on it, um, uh, it's, India is different than the United States. But don't you think, Marshall, that um, <clears throat> the um, the power and um, Wilkerson references the power to keep um, to keep certain things in place, I think the potential for um, people, young persons who probably have great potential, but between the educational um, disparities, you know, uh, schools that they attend that are um, not really developing, you know, not strong schools, and the um, the great difficulty to um, really rise. You know, we know people who do, but um, the barriers to utilizing um, talent fully does seem to be, to be um, particularly structured in the United States. So it may have um, a different basis for accomplishing the task, but I think there are, um, many things that um, constrain and in effect result in um, a similar um, outcome. And I think that's where she, you know, I think I certainly was startled with um, the thought about caste, but the very uh, building in, in our society of attitudes, which kind of say, well, that's the way it is. And um, we're not willing to uh, make some improvements tells me that that there is a caste system here. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I'm simply saying, I think that the uh, that it is possible to overcome these obstacles in the United States if we really want to, but it's very, very difficult in India. Yes, I, 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 and I would agree with that. It is possible to do, it's just very, very difficult. Well, I think I it, the, sorry, but we'll go back. I think, yeah, I, was, I think when I thought one of the insights in, uh, in Wilkerson's book was when she was talking about not so much today and comparing uh, what we face in this country and, and India, but more looking at slavery compared to caste and this whole concept of dharma is i use that that word and how you are born into an environment and so you really it's all you've ever known so it's what you expect you to be and so it kind of keeps you from wanting to rise up against it because it's your lot in life and in india it's part of your religion that you accept your fate and you make the most within those confines but she she dispels that myth and she says in the book that in both slavery and in the caste system the, the, just the, 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 the need for people to have freedom is never completely lost. And that, will, that, will, that is something that persists itself. So kind of uh, addressing the argument of one's fate and having to live within that. Barb, you had something. Well, I was, I was thinking about the, the, um, the concept of bootstraps. Um, we, we somehow, um, I was able in the 50s, in the early 60s, I guess, to transcend um, just a plain old working class, not quite middle class 
family into something a little more, but uh, at least economically. But when you look now at, I mean, I went to work when I was 13, but, and there were always lots of part-time jobs and all the kids I went to high school with had part-time jobs. And, you know, that has all changed. And so for a young person who wants to go to school, and I worked in libraries in suburban DC where there were lots of immigrant kids and they were working um, because they could get to school, they could live at home and get to school on the subway. And as long as they're, they weren't supporting their family on their part-time job, they could go to school, but they needed to be have at least enough money. But if both their parents are working on minimum wage, that makes it awfully difficult for those kids to begin to rise economically or to get an, a better education. Um, so it's not as easy as it was when we were younger. Marshall, another, another thought in another thought in response to your point about about the the very real possibility uh, to overcome um, uh, uh, racial uh, class or and other class designations but that we have some we do have social and economic mobility in our country but the experience of uh, of Wilkerson herself and the experience of people that, of color we've known in our community uh, makes it indelibly clear that they never that a person never escapes that caste uh, yeah. assignation that uh, that you're that you're always uh, a black person in, in Holland is very highly likely to be pulled over for dr for driving while black and to be uh, accosted if, if he or she drives a nice car or is seen in the in the evening walking uh, near or next to a white person uh, and it's uh, those so those kind of elements of the caste system, uh, you know, th th those tentacles remain attached, no matter, you know, even for people who've escaped other, uh, you know, other uh, class kind of el elements of the of the racism. It's a pretty pessimistic uh, look on the future of the United States. It's tough. It's a, oh. it's an old. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a good point. Uh, because I mean, uh, she's a very accomplished person. And when she describes her experience in first class. First, the assumption that she shouldn't be there and then uh, not being served or not being able to put her uh, seat back or you know not being served in a restaurant. I mean, that does give it much more of a cast flavor. A year ago, uh, participants in this course uh, read uh, uh, Neiman's Learning from the Germans. Uh, and uh, and and uh, Wilkerson in this book re refers to learning from the Germans, uh, and in that in that book, um, that book in investigated uh, and, and tried to terminate and heal from the Nazi past, and then the, the Nazi persecution. And the Germans uh, uh, or Germany has managed to deal quite constructively, certainly very imperfectly, but constructively with this past uh, of, uh, uh, of the Nazi caste system uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, persecuted Jews. Um, what, you know, what, what can we learn from, from that German experience and what can we do to deconstruct and heal from our, from our own caste system? I, uh, that was one point in the book that I did have a little problem with because I think in Europe in general, and particularly in Germany, there is an undercurrent of nationalism, which is a white nationalism, uh, particularly with the influx of migrants from the Middle East, that even though outwardly, um, Germany seems to have way risen above Nazism, uh, I, I from what I understand, there still is an undercurrent of prejudice uh, in Germany in particular, but also in Europe in general. Isn't it a case in Germany that this has been rising um, more noticeably in recent years? Um, I read this past Sunday about um, in the Times about Marine Le Pen 
in France and um, increasing um, movement toward the right and conservative views. So it seems to me Germany had has done some very um, solid things and things that we would want to admire. Um, but the movement toward the right and for whatever number of reasons um, that's occurring, but that is occurring throughout Europe. There's occurring in, in Turkey, for example. Um, and that does have significant impact on global thinking. We lived in Germany in uh, the early 70s, 72, 73. And there were many guest arbiters coming there, guest workers, because there was a shortage of uh, manual labor in, in West Germany. And, and men were coming from Greece and Turkey. Turkey. And you could recognize mm -hmm. the Turks, uh, the uh, mustached men, dark uh, skinned men in the, um, uh, in the, help, in the uh, main, main train station on, on weekends. Now, one of the, the uh, guest, guest workers who came to Cologne to work in a Ford factory, uh, a Turk, I don't remember his last name, but his, his, he brought his family over uh, in the, uh, I guess in the 80s. And one of his, and his son, uh, it turned out to be uh, a well-educated man who is actually the founder of the BioNTech company in Germany that, uh, that built, that, that invented, that developed the uh, vaccine that was then developed and, and uh, produced by Pfizer. Uh, to me, it's, it's a, uh, uh, an example where the Germans uh, accepted uh, the guest workers who were not, uh, and there was debate about whether we should, whether they should allow them to stay after the uh, labor crisis uh, uh, re was reduced, but they in fact did stay, they become citizens, and now this contribution is, um, is pretty dramatic. Uh, we, uh, a few years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, we kind of co-hosted a, a young man uh, from Germany, he was he was a Turkish Muslim German, and uh, we we uh, visited him there, and, and he said that you know he was certainly actually one thing I took him to get some uh, uh, sports shoes. He was going to play soccer, and he was amazed at how nice he was being treated <laughs> by wow. in downtown Holland compared to the way he was treated in Germany. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's not just Germany. The, the, the whole, recently, the whole immigrant stuff with so many migrants coming from North Africa and the Middle East, what with um, all of the civil unrest and the violence going on there. And so these people are running and they're coming in great numbers and they're coming into uh, countries that are largely homogeneous. And there are lots of people who find that disturbing. And of course, these people generally do not have financial, um, are, not, uh, are not financially secure. And so they become part of the social network and people are, there, there's an economic backlash. Um, that's also true in Great Britain. My, my daughter lives in Great Britain. And um, it used to be that they were unhappy, a few folks were unhappy with some of the Commonwealth immigrants who could be identified basically by color, Pakistanis and Indians and so on. But um, now they're, the, the primary targets are Polish workers and that led large it was a large part of the battle over brexit um was that these people are coming because we're part of the eu and we can't keep them out and blah 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 um and they're overwhelming our social system and all of that um and so all of that in western europe is is a concern um but i see I see us as, I see the racist problems here are sort of part of, I have to be bigger and better than somebody else. Uh, it, it's, it's in really, I think you're, 
you're bringing up the question of in what ways uh, are these uh, are these really some very severe uh, uh, stresses, uh, economic and social stresses on current systems? How are they different from uh, from the caste system that uh, that Wilkerson's trying to make yeah. a case for? In some ways, they're in some ways they're very similar, and in other ways they are identical, and it's difficult sometimes to sort out what's what. But I see, what I see basically in terms of the neo-Nazis and that sort of thing in Europe is basically what I saw on January the 6th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of similarities, yes, very much. I um, think one of the things too, getting back to your question, your point, Tom, is that there's a danger that we mix these together because it empowers and legitimizes efforts that may be based on race, but they're doing it for, they're saying they're doing it for economic reasons. And I think there's a real danger there in muddying the water and not getting back to the true roots of where we have the issues. And not every problem is going to be this, this American caste, and not every problem in the United States is an American caste problem. And, and even problems related to social groups, racial groups, um, perceived racial groups, economic groups, they're not all the same thing as this, you know, what, you know, what Wilkerson's uh, trying to say is the, the uniquely American caste system. Um, the, uh, the one thing that the German, I mean, the Germans certainly, like everybody else, are struggling with all these issues, but the Germans, for instance, have, uh, in, in contrast, the United States have zero, um, uh, um, commemorations or celebrations or statues to, uh, made of any Nazi figure in the whole country. There is no statue of Hitler or of any, or of Goebbels or Goering or, or anybody else. Uh, there, and, um, and there are, there are reminders everywhere. They've built uh, uh, museums and, uh, and tourist attractions essentially uh, that could be felt by Germans as humiliating. Uh, the, the author of Learning from the Germans, Susan Neiman, who lives, she's a Southern Jew, the American Jew, uh, who grew up in the South and lives now, likes, likes living in Berlin, uh, says that uh, what the Nazis have done, or excuse me, what the Germans have done uh, is that rather than feeling um, humiliated uh, by or, or, or merely ashamed of their past, they, they've been able to get past that without losing a sense of responsibility. It's a little bit like the house image, the old, old house uh, uh, needing the responsible maintenance. And, you, and is that something that, that we could do in this country? Is that possible? I, I wonder in the case of Germany, because it was sort of occupied after the war, I mean, the occupying forces aren't gonna let statues of Hitler grow up. I mean, it's different in the South. After the Civil War, we didn't do what we probably should have done in this. I don't know. Well, you know, a lot of the statues, though, came up in long after the Civil War in the 20s and the 50s, just making a point that uh, whites were on top and blacks were beneath and yeah. whatever. So they, they weren't really put up in the 1860s. They, they were put up in the 1900s forward. So some of them might have been old statues, but a lot of them were during the Jim Crow era. So. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting. I was in I spent a lot of time in Germany and the stepping stones in Berlin and a lot of the different cities have people's names and and when they died and where where they were um, confined and you you can't miss it. They're all over on on plaques on the streets and whatever. So um, it is like Tom said. It's it really is part of their history and and it's a sad part of their history. But they um, they're not letting themselves forget it. They don't want to have that repeat. And um, it just tells us what we're all capable of doing when we get into a fervor of some sort and following a charismatic leader that um, leads us the wrong way. And I think um, we like to say we'd never be capable of that, but obviously we did it during the Indian period of time and during the Civil War. So we're capable of a lot of things. And uh, I think we all have to remember that um, we try not to have that happen again uh, any place in the world. But. Uh, we definitely whitewash history, don't we? Yeah. But the, but Literally. 
Yeah. But interestingly enough, what's happening in Germany, what has happened in Germany in terms of the past of the war, it doesn't sound like it's translating fully into the whole nationalistic issue with other peoples coming into their country. Yeah. It, this is sort of a trend that's going in Europe. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I keep going back to the fact that we have limited resources on this earth. We have populations that are growing like crazy. I mean, when are we going to hate hit eight? billion people it's not very far into the future and the, and how did this stuff get distributed i mean we're seeing people migrating because i think of climate wars happen because of climate because of limited resources how do we deal with that on a global um but I think, Helen, Germany let in about 200,000 people in, I can't remember, 2018, 2019, huge numbers of people, a small country. Here in the United States, we let in 18,000 people last year, and we're an enormous country with lots of room and lots of economic things. So when you have a small country like that that put let in 200,000 people, it's a, it's a huge, huge change. Uh, and it's, it's always like... Um, if we have someone come up from the bottom, do you come down from the top? And I think that whole issue of, of place is, is really a, an important thing. People don't want to change economic places. Uh, do, do, uh, do any of you have any thoughts about uh, the possibility of an American Truth and Reconciliation Commission about, uh, about our history, our, our 400 year old history of, uh, of uh, enslavement of black people and, and subsequent uh, um, uh, uh, denigration of racism and, um, and caste system. Uh, any thoughts about a truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. kind of thing? I'm, <clears throat> I'm very afraid that it would, like so many other things, just be something that became a political um, football, and you would have one um, party objecting to it, and um, it never not not accepting it, and and it not going anywhere. I think that it has. I think it has to start from the bottom up, not from the top down, for the very reason um, that Ann said. It's not gonna. It's not gonna happen from the top down. What, what bottom, though? What's the bottom? The bottom is us. Hasp. Small groups. Um, you know, do we start small and then we go to, if you look at how Holland did with the uh, LGBT issue, took a long time just to get a, a community to deal with that issue. But now that community has dealt with it and, and taken a stand. And if another, enough small groups, be it municipalities or any, any groups, a wellspring, how did Black Lives Matter get traction from the bottom, not from the top? And it seems to me that this political divide, that this horror that we're living through basically at a local level, when you're working with people one-on-one, -on -one, people on the other side of the divide, if you've got a project to work on or something that you're concretely coming together for, it, divide, it, it helps mitigate a lot of that uh, hostility between the division, I guess. Face-to-face -face, um, commonality is the glue. When there's a disaster in this country, Everybody comes together, Katrina or, or hurricanes, people come together and it doesn't matter what color is standing next to you, you have a common, you're working towards a common goal. And that happens at the lower level. Although COVID hasn't really necessarily solved our problems, but it is a national tragedy. And I think in addition to working at the local level, we have to work at our own personal level you know, discussions like this and work in the community, but just thinking about our own history and learning more of the history we were never taught. Um, I mean, this community for a long time, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. 
you know, it was a, our own little caste system in a way. Um, and there are all kinds of other levels to that. But I think for each and every one of us, we all have work to do. I think that brings to mind to me, again, getting back to the book and one of the very powerful metaphors. And it goes back to uh, the Nazi concentration camps. And she was describing the ashes that were following, falling in the community and the neighborhoods around it. And uh, people just accepting that because they as individuals, it was bigger than they were. And so that the image of the, uh, of the woman sweeping the ashes off of the steps and that that was gonna clear the way and she could go on with life without realizing you can't sweep away responsibility uh, and everyone's responsibility for it and that each as individuals can make a difference, need to make a difference. I thought that was a very powerful metaphor. And there needs, to, there needs in the end to be connection between uh, personal and local uh, efforts, uh, neighborhood efforts. Uh, there needs to be connection between these kinds of uh, efforts and the structures that uh, that uh, that hold in place a thing like caste, the, the which are legislative. Uh, these are laws and policies. So there needs to be connection in the end uh, between local personal efforts and uh, and uh, and the top levels, even though it, it it top down isn't isn't an answer. I think that also, you know maybe we can't there's not some major thing we can work on right now but just in our conversations with people when something comes up and people are displaying attitudes that we think are just you know bad attitudes um we have to talk about where we're coming from too we can't hide how we what we believe because it's that conversation and that interaction that helps to normalize a better point of view as opposed to it being you know something that other people just don't want to hear about. I, I was silence, surprised. Uh, I'm sorry, our silence at those times, Helen, speak volumes against our beliefs. If we're not willing to speak. Yes. Yeah. It. It's not easy. I mean, it's not easy. I just had an incident here with my neighbor about something between our property. And I was worried and upset about something. And I went to talk to them. And I know them now better than I did before we have a better relationship. It's just, it's been really marvelous because I was willing to speak out. Nothing to do with race or anything like that, but just interacting with people when things happen and let them, letting them know where you're coming from can make a big difference in your relationship with them and in their attitudes about different things. Fran, you had something to say too. Yeah, I was really surprised um, that there were so many um, statues and symbols uh, kind of honoring uh, the Confederacy. I didn't realize there were that many. And I think it is a good step in acknowledgement that these things are being removed uh, and that with um, American Indians that some of those, the names of sports teams are mm -hmm. being changed. Because sometimes people say, oh, well, that's just, we get, you know, what's the difference if they're called Redskins or whatever. But those things are really important and are part of acknowledging a really bad history, I think. Yes. Fits together with your earlier <laughs> argument, uh, Linda, about, about, uh, about children's books, about the images, and, and, you, and you too, um, Bev, um, the, the images that, uh, that, that uh, prolong and promulgate these uh, negative uh, views of people. Well, one thing that uh, worries me about uh, what Bob suggested, which is very right, that that change needs to start from the bottom rather than the top. But when you have someone at the top like Ron Johnson, who came out and said that he wasn't afraid when the, the, the Patriots attacked on Jan January 6th, but if it had been Blacks in Antifa, he would have been afraid. That isn't just one misguided person who gives that opinion because you've got possibly roughly 30% of our country is listening to that and saying, oh yes, that's he's right. I think also we, where do we start has to begin in our own families. 
I think um, we've all experienced family members who are on the other side of the political divide and how hard it is to have conversations. And so families end up either fractured or not talking about it. And uh, both of those outcomes, not talking about it and being fractured aren't really that positive. So if we're gonna look at what I can do as just a person sitting in my house, um, maybe it is starting with that family member that I find it so difficult to talk to. Thank you, Barb. We're nearing the end of our time. Um, I, I, I wanted just to present a, one, a final question. And th this uh, question, is, uh, I, I'd suggest thinking about not in terms of what, how feasible it is or how it could happen, but just whether you think it's a good idea. And that's the idea of reparations uh, for, for, uh, for African-Americans who have been, you know, whose economic opportunities have been, uh, have been denied and prevented uh, for, uh, you know, for the centuries, uh, all the way up, and up to the, the very recent, uh, uh, almost virtually the, presence, the present. Uh, what are your ideas about financial reparation from the overall society to African Americans? Well, Tom, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was about to suggest everybody read Tana Hesey Coates' reparations book, which I read a couple of years ago, and I'm going to read again. Um, because when you look at how we have collected our massive capital base in white America by privilege, um, mortgages were denied, uh, houses were denied, and most of my capital. This is from I owned a house in San Diego, and wow, did it go up. And bet, you know what? Nobody could have bought a house in Del Mar, California with zero blacks, and it's a totally liberal place that won't let Walmart in, but their privilege has given them the right to say, oh, you need to work your way up. Come on. It's an equal opportunity place. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just such a fraud. After you read Tana Easy Goat's book, you go, wow, oh, hello, what am I doing here? I'm sitting on a pile of money that I collected just because of my skin color. That's it's another a shocking, of, shocking reala realization when you get to that. Another zone of our education that, that uh, was denied us is, is the knowledge of, of how systemically all of these things, including the GI Bill and going back to be, the ability to own property after the Civil War, all these things. Uh, have been systemically withheld from uh, from African Americans. So, any other thoughts about reparations before we? Well, well, well yeah, she didn't say the word reparations in the whole book, which means she's pulling her punches. Sorry, go okay. ahead. Well, I, oh, yes. I think about it is student loans because if you're getting a house loan right now, it's two to three percent, and student loans are still at eight percent. And who needs to get student loans? People that are poor, people that are black, people that are immigrants, and we could change that system because I don't understand. Obviously, they don't have the equity in a house that is backing it up, but uh, that's putting those people at, at huge economic costs right from the get-go when they're trying to get themselves raised up. So that's one way I think we. It's not reparations, but it's giving more equal opportunity and getting those loan rates down that are more equitable with the car loans and house loans. Doesn't it seems just awful that you would saddle these young people with these huge debts before they even get started. So I think that's one thing we could do to help. So I, Washington universities are giving tuition because the great grandfather built this place. So maybe you should be allowed in. <laughs> so there is a little bit of this uh, happening now. I, I really a, a question I have about reparations relates to, uh, it seems like African-Americans are the, are the primary recipient of that. And I just wonder why uh, the American Indian isn't lumped in there. They certainly uh, <laughs> suffered greatly for what our country did to them and their land uh, in the developments yes. of the country. And I, I hear very little of them mentioned when you talk about reparations. Uh, only because we haven't got around to it. The Japanese internment is the precedent. We paid in the Korematsu case a lot of money to people in World War II that we interned. And I had a family friend whose uh, sister died in such a camp. And it's, it's clear we have the legal precedent to give reparations and we could do it for uh, anybody who's been harmed by our racist policies. So yeah, the Indians would be next. And there are international uh, uh, precedents as well, New Zealand, Germany. No case is, ex is exactly the same as ours, but, but there are places that have done this. I mean, why, why do you say next? Why do I say next? Because it's a precedent. You're a lawyer, you see 
okay, this person got it, this person similarly situated, and this person similarly situated, they eventually would be next <laughs> because of a legal oh, precedent. I just I just interpreted that to mean the blacks come first and the Indians. Oh no, come there's next. no order. It, it's oh, really no. not a. Uh, it, I'm not ranking them. I'm just saying they're all going to have an issue that we have already recognized. We can uh, reimburse people who we've wronged. And we're well, talking about something as theoretic, and it it, it could they, these these groups specific groups could be uh, addressed in this at the same time if that ever could happen. Yeah, in the American Rescue, in the American Rescue Plan, there's some money uh, for repayment of loans for Black farmers, uh, which maybe is interesting as a precedent. Yeah, I'm an attorney for farmers, and for years I've been going to conferences where I heard people talk about how we never gave loans to them, we never we took away their land. You know, we've been messing with Black farmers to keep them out of rural America, basically, because we don't, mm -hmm. you know, we want them to work for us, not next to us. And that's a huge, I wish somebody would write a really good book like Isabel, maybe she'll turn to agriculture next, because that's a, a place where a lot's been going on we didn't recognize. We talk, we're talking a lot about things that are happening more recently, but I really wonder, what would the economic situation of this country be if it hadn't been for slaves? Where would we be as a nation? I, I, you know. Yeah. Now I'm going to throw something in here and I found, feel like a politician because I've been wanting to say something about this the whole time and nobody's brought it up and it's not relevant necessarily to even the topic. But one of the things in the, in the epilogue that she talks about is uh, those people who get old enough to grow into one of the biggest castes in the world and that's old people. Do you remember that paragraph? Yeah. Do I have to read it to you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'd like to say one last thing about reparations. There's a great book, Tears We Cannot Stop by Michael Eric Dyson. It's a really powerful book. And on the topic of reparations, um, it, he kind of postulates it as, okay, that's a really big topic. And it's really too big for any of us to really get our arms around. So we could do individual reparations. We could offer some money for scholarships for kids in schools that don't usually end up going to college. There are a lot of opportunities if we're willing to open our eyes and say, I could do this. I could put some money here. It's not gonna change the world, but it will certainly change the life of one person. And and, and it's kind of like, it, it's the same as before. If we start at the bottom up, there's a tipping point for everything and we never know where the tipping point is. And when the tipping point comes, everything falls into place. So from the bottom up, we just have to contribute to the tipping, to reaching the tipping point. But, but that makes- a, Thank that, you. That makes I am money. Really very sorry to have to say that we have come to the end of this wonderful discussion. And I would like you all to join me in thanking Tom and um, for leading it. It was uh, obviously we could keep going for a long time, but we, we have to end because it's 11 o'clock. However, I have um, two announcements. The first announcement is that HASS works way in the future and it, it is time for those of us who like to talk about nonfiction books to um, develop the list of books that we wanna read next fall. So I am asking you to do uh, this. If you have one like, for instance, um, Tears We Cannot Stop, please email me, it's Diana Nelson 41 here I was born, uh, at gmail.com and or has, and just say, Diana, I recommend blah, 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 okay? Then I will send out to you this uh, annotated list of books and we'll vote. And then we'll 
I'll twist arms <laughs> to find lovely people like Tom who will lead discussions and um, we'll go forward. So that is the, uh, the first announcement. Please send me any suggestions you have, perhaps that would continue this discussion. And um, that would be lovely. My these second announcement. Oh, great. Thank you. And these are. Yeah, Thank these will be the last ones. Thanks. And um, the last announcement I have is to invite you all to join the nonfiction book group next month when Marshall will be leading us in a discussion. Look, see how, see how thin this is? It's not like some of our huge big tomes, but it is called The Corporation That Changed the World. And it's, uh, it's about the East India Company. So please join us next month. Please join me in thanking Tom and please uh, send suggestions for books for next year. Thank you all. And, and I want to thank you all too. This a, what a great discussion group. I also have a one, one final little thing uh, from, uh, from my wife, Sharon, who's the head of curriculum. If this, if this course has sparked in you an idea for another HASP course, uh, please email that to either HASP or to uh, Sharon Arnshorst at uh, snarnshorst.com. Thank you.